This week in lab, we're going to change gears just a little bit. So far this semester, we've spent a lot of time looking at very quantitative experiments. Quantitative meaning that they deal with numbers and measuring numerical values. This week and next week, we're going to change that up a little bit and we're going to look at a qualitative experiment. Now the nice thing about qualitative experiments is that you've been doing them your entire life. Qualitative experiments are all about making observations and coming to conclusions based on those observations. So it's very much in the spirit of the scientific method. I don't think I have to tell you a whole lot about how to do the experiment because again, you're using your eyes, your ears, your nose, you're using your senses to figure out what's happening in the reactions that you're looking at. There are just a couple of little things that I want to go over to help us clear things up about some technique and a little bit about some terminology that maybe we misuse a little bit too often. So first of all, before you start with your experiment, you're just going to make some observations about the materials that you're going to be using. So we need to be able to make accurate and correct observations about those materials. And the first place that usually causes a little bit of trouble is what if I am using this reagent and I want to describe its appearance. That doesn't seem like it's that hard to do. You look at it and you describe what it looks like, but it's one of the first places that people use a little bit of inaccurate terminology because I want you to think about what you would call this reagent. How would you describe its visual appearance? You have an idea in your head? What did you call it? How many of you called this colorless? How many of you called it white? That's two ways to describe this solution and depending what you're trying to describe, neither one of them may be correct. So let's think about it in terms of some counter examples. If you wanted to compare these two substances, how would you describe both of them? We've got one that looks, well, it looks like water because it is water. And we've got one that looks, well, not like water. How would you describe these two substances? I would bet that a lot of you would call this one white. Then what do you call this one? If this is white, we need another term for this. When you're describing the color of a solution, you need to use color terms. This one is white. This one doesn't have any color, so this is a colorless solution. What about that other descriptor? What about clear? Well, this one sure doesn't look clear. This one looks kind of cloudy. This one does look clear. Clear versus cloudy is a description of something called the turbidity of a solution. So when you're describing the appearance of a solution, make sure that if you want to use color, you use color words. And if you want to describe the turbidity of the solution, you use turbidity terms like clear or cloudy. So that's probably the first observation, the first description we'll make. Something about the color of a solution and maybe even the turbidity of a solution, whether it's clear or cloudy. What else might we observe about these solutions? Well, let's keep using our senses. So we've used sight. How about smell? Lots of chemical reagents have very distinct smells, but we've got to be a little bit careful because lots of chemical reagents have distinct smells and they're not always pleasant smells and sometimes they can be pretty overpowered. So if we're going to smell a chemical reagent, and again, I know that this is water, so I know I don't have anything to worry about, the one thing you don't want to do is stick your nose right on that bottle and because depending what's in there, 
I could have been laying on the floor at this point because that would have been pretty bad if it were some of the reagents you're going to be using this week in lab. So when you want to smell a reagent, always start cautiously. So take the top off and you've got a nice little sampler here. You can wave that around a little bit. Maybe, maybe you'll get a little bit of a smell off of that. If you don't, use your hand to, to waft some of the vapors towards you. And if you still can't smell anything, well, then you can be a little bit more daring, but still cautious, and just give it a little smell. If you smell something, okay. If you don't, you don't. A lot of salt, a lot of ionic compounds won't give rise to any real smell because they're not volatile enough. They don't form vapors enough to smell them. So smelling the reagents that you're going to be using is a legitimate test and one that you probably should use as long as you're careful. The only other technique that I want to talk about today in the pre-lab is a technique that, again, many of you will probably think, I don't need to learn about that. I know how to use an eyedropper, but unfortunately, a lot of you probably will be tempted to not use an eyedropper correctly. These bottles and all of the dropper bottles you're going to be using have to be kept uncontaminated. If we start mixing the contents of the bottles, everybody ends up getting bad results. So, you need to be using your droppers properly. And what does that mean? That means that if I want to add drops to something, I should hold the dropper above the mouth of whatever I'm adding to, like this test tube, and add my drops that way. By doing that, I won't get a bunch of whatever could be in the test tube on the dropper. So the last thing that we have to talk about for this week's experiment is how can you tell if a reaction occurs? There are a lot of different reaction types that we may have talked about in class. We've talked about acid-base reactions. We've talked about precipitate reactions. You're going to observe a lot of those things. But let's think about what we can observe. First of all, what about the color? If the color of the reaction changes, then there's probably a reaction occurring. If a solid forms, that's a precipitate reaction or precipitation reaction. So that tells us a reaction occurs. If a gas forms and bubbles appear, that should tell us that a, pre that a reaction has occurred. Some of the other things that are maybe a little bit more subtle is what if the odor of the mixture changes? What if you've got something that starts out very smelly and after you combine it with another reagent it doesn't smell anymore or go the other direction? What if you've got something that doesn't have any discernible odor but after you mix two reagents together it starts smelling like something? That's another sign that a reaction occurred. And finally, one that can be a little difficult to detect is temperature changes. We've been using temperature changes for the last couple weeks to look at different reactions, and they're pretty easy to detect when we're using a temperature probe and we're being very careful and quantitative about our data. But sometimes they can be a little bit harder to tell just by feeling the test tube that we're working with. So, those are the things that we want to keep an eye on to see if a reaction has occurred. Probably a good idea to review solubility rules and make sure that you read over the experimental procedure before you come to lab and think about a plan, how you're going to approach this problem both in the first week when you're going to be working with known solutions and in the second week when you're going to be analyzing an unknown. Good luck!